Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today, we will be traveling to the city of Lublin in eastern Poland to meet with Zemowit Kalowicz from Theater NN, a cultural institution which safeguards the memory of the city's Jewish population which flourished for centuries before Germany invaded Poland in 1939 and murdered almost all of the Polish Jews. The Jewish population peaked in terms of percentage in Lublin during the 19th century until people around Lublin started moving in. And I think before the Second World War, there's still one third of the population being Jewish. I was hoping you could elaborate about the cooperation or the relationship between the Polish population and the Jewish population between the world wars. Well, it's a very long subject, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can say that uh, more and more uh, Polish people mm -hmm. were uh, traveling to our town and settling here mm -hmm. uh, because of development of our town. Yeah. There were new uh, factories uh, uh, that were <laughs> being created in our town. Mm -hmm. uh, the city was more and more uh, modern uh, with electricity and so on. And, uh, also, Jewish people uh, that were here, uh, most of them were of the Hasidic movement. Um, and they, while uh, they were under um, Tsar regime, uh, they were kind of persecuted. They were not the first class citizens. Right. When the um, freedom of Poland started in 1918, uh, suddenly they found themselves first class citizens with all of the privileges and laws that Polish people in had. Lublin. In Lublin also. And they, well, they also started to develop. Mm. Uh, the Kasidic community built amazing building, uh, the second yeshiva, the high rabbinic school, uh, that is uh, one of the not many places that are still in existence today. They were, it was not destroyed by uh, Germans. Uh, they uh, gathered the uh, most important and uh, most uh, the wisest rabbis to, uh, to teach in that school. Uh, it was an Oxford for the Jewish people. Mm. Uh, to be a student of this university, you have to be, um, you have to have a letter of recommendation from two separate rabbis. You have to pass a very hard exams and so on. And the rabbis that graduated at that, that uh, university were really sought after in all of the Europe. Um, also, the, but the Hasidic movement was not only movement in the uh, Jewish district. There were socialists, um, secular Jews. Uh, they were trying to create a new uh, building, uh, a community house for, for Jewish people, uh, the House of Paris, they were calling this. And uh, this building, uh, this community center, should be opened on the September the 1st of 1939. This was the day the war broke out right. and it was never really opened. Mm. Also, there were assimilated Jews, uh, Jews like Franciszka Arnsteinova, the great poet. Right. You see, when I'm reading the poems of that lady, she's Polish, she's really deeply pat patriotic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were many Jews like this, but all of these um, uh, groups have the one point of interest that was joining them. Mm -hmm. It was a trade. Yeah. And they were trying to make a living, uh, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, so some of them were trading with Polish uh, citizens, but some of them, especially Hasidic uh, people, were very closed. Uh, th their society was not open for uh, another religions or cultures. So they were trading among each other, they were in marrying among each other, having friends and so on. Uh, these people were speaking mostly Yiddish. Some of them were not speaking Polish at all. Um, they were hiring translators when they have to go to the court. Polish law was not had no problem. Polish authorities had no problem with this. Mm -hmm. um, but still, this was a very closed society, and Polish people were not interfering with this. Um, still, the people who were let's say uh, assimilated, they have their part with uh, the 
life of our city, of light of life of our town, uh, cu cultural life, and uh, many others. You see, um, they were, have uh, theaters, they have cinemas, uh, movies like the book was made uh, on, in the. Kazimierz near Lublin. Mm. Uh, this was one of the greatest uh, Yiddish movie ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, many other uh, cultural events were taking uh, place in the Jewish district. Also, there were mm, things like uh, Football teams, Jewish football teams, Maccabi Lublin, uh, they were playing with uh, Polish <laughs> football teams mm -hmm. also, and there were some even uh, problems with uh, uh, football fans, okay. <laughs> like always, <laughs> let's say. Um, um, but still, these three groups, the major groups, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, secular Jews, mm -hmm. assimilated Jews, and um, Casidic Jews, were the mm, well, have the same rights and, and uh, privileges that all of the citizens had. And they were just living here mm -hmm. with no great problems. Uh, in late 30s, there were some problems like broken windows made mm -hmm. by some of um, uh, well nationalists and so on. But still, it was not nothing big. Nobody right. was ever killed. There was no pogrom or something it's like this. the exception, not well, the exception, culture Exception, absolute exception. Yeah. Uh, but still, some Jewish people were feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, the Zionist movement was born and some of the Jewish people were traveling to Palestine to build uh, another uh, place for the Jewish people mm -hmm. that would be later called Israel. Today, the citizens of Israel speak Hebrew, but their Ashkenazi ancestors spoke the language Yiddish. Next up, our guide Mr. Karovish will tell us the significance of this ancient, near-forgotten language. In our earlier conversation, you brought up the language Yiddish, and as I know, it's a blend of many languages, but that's my extent of the knowledge when it comes to that. So if you can tell me a little bit about what happened at the time. Well, uh, Yiddish is a very special language. Right. Uh, you see, when the Jews uh, came to Europe, mm -hmm. uh, they were mostly speaking some Roman language. Right. We are not really sure how it sound, uh, uh, sounded. <laughs> but when they were coming uh, to the east, they were tra traveling through Germany. Mm -hmm. And they pick up, pick up lots and lots of the words and, and the grammatic structure of the uh, German language. Mm -hmm. When they came to Poland, uh, they again pick up some words from Slavic uh, speaking mm -hmm. uh, Polish people and they created unique language with some parts Hebrew, some parts uh, from Roman languages, mm -hmm. many parts, most of the parts were from the German mm -hmm. language and also some words are Polish uh, words. Mm -hmm. uh, also, <laughs> when they were speaking this mm -hmm. language, uh, they were, mm, well, creating some uh, special uh, language for all of the people who lived, uh, lived around them. Mm -hmm. Let's say in uh, Polish uh, Lublin, there, were, there are some words from Yiddish, mm -hmm. still to this day. When I was a little kid, I was uh, calling my brother Breidak, mm -hmm. not knowing that this, what, what does it really mean. Right. This is from Broidak, this is from Yiddish. Oh. Uh, many other words are uh, also, uh, like for the naughty child, Bachor, mm -hmm. it is also from Yiddish. Yeah. Also, the Yiddish language pick up many words from Pol Polish, like Sosna, or even uh, the uh, pickles are called Ogurkas, <laughs> this is also Polish, yeah. Polish word. Um, the Kasidic minority in Lublin uh, were uh, extremely uh, uh, connected to that language. Mm -hmm. All of the wise men were speaking this language. They were creating the books of literature, of, of uh, philosophy, of theology mm -hmm. in exactly this language. Mm -hmm. They were speaking on a daily basis in this language. Why? Because Hebrew was the holy language. They were, all of them were learning Hebrew, but Hebrew was the language uh, that should not be sullied uh, by using to to say the daily Conduct trade or things. yes, yes. Okay. So they were speaking uh, Yiddish, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see Yiddish on the posters for films, for mm -hmm. movies. On that time, for the uh, mm, uh, 
theater, plays, uh, but also <laughs> on the every sign of the shop there were some Yiddish letters or something like this. Mm -hmm. So it was a very popular language. In it's almost Europe. like a representation of how the cultures mingle together. Yes, to... very, mm -hmm. very close. After centuries of coexistence between Poles and Jews, Lublin lost its Jewish population during the Second World War. Cultural institutions such as Theater NN are putting in a great effort to remind Poles about the centuries of joint Polish-Jewish history and the traces it has left on today's Poland. 